Hi, my name is Terry QT, and I'm the founder and director of Deep Sea Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to the educational channel where we talk about all topics related to breast cancer and breast reconstruction. I'm very pleased today to welcome my guest, Dr. Don Dizan, who is an oncologist specializing in women's cancers. He is the director of women's cancers at Lifespan Cancer, Cancer Institute and director of medical oncology of Rhode Island Hospital. He's also the professor of medicine at the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University. This is our topic today. His research interests are in novel treatments of women's cancers and issues related to survivorship, particularly as they relate to sexual health after cancer for both men and women. Dr. Dizan, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to meet you. It's great to meet you too. I am going to let you take over and mm. discuss this very important topic that, you know, sometimes we just don't talk often enough about, but it's very much a part of our daily living. Yep. I, you know, and I agree with that. It's, you know, I have been talking about sexual health for, for over a decade. And it's, it's interesting to me that it's still something that people want to hear about and that both women and men still request more information on. And what that tells me is that even as survivorship has developed as a field, that there are still areas in our lives that we're not comfortable talking about. So it's interesting when I started uh, as a sexual health provider, it's because I was sensitized to the importance of this aspect of people's lives as a fellow and then as attending at Sloan Kettering. And it was only until I left Sloan Kettering that I realized that not everybody had access to sexual health counseling and services after cancer. And that was something that I set out to try to change. And I have now set up three different programs in sexual health at three different institutions. And each time uh, it came as almost uh, a surprise that this was a topic that someone wanted to devote some time to. Um, and I think it's reflective of the fact that not everyone is comfortable talking about sexuality, but that clinicians aren't that comfortable asking about it either. But if you look at it in the context of oncology, we're very comfortable talking about, you know, very private things, mm -hmm. you know, bowel function, nausea, vomiting, um, you know, depression, anxiety, you know, loneliness, um, yet sexual health is considered this almost taboo aspect, which it shouldn't be. And the upshot is that even though it's something that almost everybody treated for breast cancer experiences to a degree yeah. um, or not, right? Either it's there, it's sort of, you know, it's under the surface, but really not that important all the way up to the people who lose relationships, lose marriages. Yeah, you know? you know, I thought about that before our interview. And mm -hmm. that, I hear that so often. And that breaks mm -hmm. my heart. Because, you know, what that does is not only does it affect the relationship, but it could potentially affect cancer care in terms mm -hmm. of insurance coverage, because then that all switches. You know, it, it has mm -hmm. um, kind of broad ranging Effects. It does. It does. Motivation to pursue therapy might even, you know, have an impact on adherence. Certainly has an impact on what a woman or a man sees reflected back at them in a mirror. You oh, know, yeah. all of that is impacted. And when relationships suffer, everyone suffers. Yeah. And when I look at, you know, how people access me, it's interesting for people who are newly diagnosed and ending treatment, you know, most providers will refer them to me, but 
for those who are living with advanced disease or even metastatic disease, yeah. they are not referred to me. They find me and refer themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think it just reflects this sense that if you're living with advanced disease, you have so much other things to worry about oh, wow. that this is not important. And quite frankly, it's important no matter what you're oh. going through in your life. Sexual health is something so inherently human yeah. that no one should have to give it up. Uh, if they don't want to. Well, I mean, okay, come on. We were, we were all given the body parts, mm -hmm. right? I, that's what I, you know, it's, but, but because of the nature of it, it's more difficult to talk about. It is. Can, can we, you know, you're such an expert on this, Dr. Dijon. Can you tell us about, what, can we start with the physicality of it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's important to talk about the physicality in terms of the changes that happen to one's body after breast cancer, because yeah. all of the aspects of how surgery and chemotherapy, endocrine treatments and radiation, mm -hmm. all of what they do impacts one's sexuality. And in terms of trying to phrase this, I like to use Rosemary Bassin's model of female sexual health, which really starts at the premise that women wake up sexually because they develop a want of something more in their private lives, this want of intimacy, mm -hmm. which leads them to discover that when certain parts of their body, especially the breasts, are touched, it's stimulating and leads to an arousal. That arousal wakes up desire, and when desire is satisfied, the whole thing circles again. Now, not everybody subscribes to this, and certainly there may be some points in one's life where it's not about intimacy, it's about hunger. And there's this bypass loop of intimacy that is also present, and it's not displayed here where it incorporates hunger. Suffice to say that for people treated for breast cancer, every single aspect of this model is impacted by treatments and by the diagnosis. So a woman who uh, has a lumpectomy and radiation or a standard mastectomy with or without reconstruction will have a negative impact on their stimuli, which means that they're not going to have the same arousal signals and that can dampen their desire. And even if they allow themselves or want themselves to have any kind of sexual activity, it won't be satisfying. And this whole aspect is never explained to people who are undergoing treatment for breast cancer. But the other thing that's really important to note in this model is that female sexual health is not associated with any singular sexual activity, that that link between desire and satisfaction can be a sexual act and it can be an intimate act, holding hands, or it can even be a kind act, making one dinner, bringing one flowers, that can be as emotionally satisfying to someone as sex used to be. So there's this freeing aspect of female sexual health that allows one to rediscover it after a cancer diagnosis as someone is also healing. So I think this is a really important aspect because in terms of what someone looks at when they look in a mirror after breast cancer, the data is very clear. Even as much as your significant other will tell you you are still or as or even more beautiful, the harshest critic is the one that's staring back at you. Yes. And, and giving yourself that time to heal is so, so important. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think explaining it like this too brings, I would think it would bring such clarity to some women. It's not often mm -hmm. like this. It's really not. And, you know, I think we're so used to thinking that sexual activities brings about satisfaction and that foreplay is a buildup towards sexual activity. And that might have been before something as traumatic has happened. But it is that kind of trauma that makes one realize that female sexual health is very complicated. It cannot be simplified. And there are various aspects 
one that builds on another rather than simultaneously experienced. A lot of layers. Lots and lots of layers. And it can all be, we can work out how to recover. It, you know, quite frankly, Terry, the, that the one thing that I hear from people who see me in a sexual health consult, they complain of the lack of desire. But when you roll that back, when you actually explore that, oftentimes it's because sex has become painful due to the side effects of treatment, or they've lost the ability to feel as they used to feel when their breast or their chest wall is touched. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things that can be addressed, but really it's the confusion that women have because their body has betrayed them. You know, and it's just that process of really trying to re- reclaim it for them. Yes. And yeah. I think the switch in the mind of a cancer patient that things can return, but they will be a different type of experience. A hundred percent. Right. Right. You know, it's, it's like I almost say, you know, what is your reference point Mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about what you want and need and wish for currently? Because if you're looking to rediscover who you were when you were 16 after breast cancer at 40, that's not realistic. Mm -hmm. It can be different. It'll be, it won't be the same, but it can be as satisfying and as fulfilling even in its difference, you know? So just providing that perspective, I think is really important. Can we talk about breast specific Mm -hmm. sexual health? Absolutely. You know, I've had reconstruction um, and I had nerve reconstruction. Not all women, Mm-hmm. have access to that possibility. Right, right. And I think it's such a groundbreaking thing yeah. to, to even learn about um, because this whole aspect of what's called breast-specific sensuality is a new term that my colleague Jennifer Goss actually explored with patients that she had taken to surgery herself. And she conducted this, what we call convenience sample, meaning they showed up in her office and she queried them and just asked how important were the, your breasts or your chest wall to you before the surgery. And here you're seeing she broke them down into the surgical procedures that were done, either a press conserving surgery, modified radical mastectomy without reconstruction, and then modified radical mastectomy with reconstruction. Before surgery, 80 to 90% of people felt their breasts were so important in their, in their um, sexuality. That figure drops by at least 10 percentage points, no matter the surgical procedure. And it was worse in patients who didn't reconstruct. And what was curious is those figures of losing your sensuality were tied to surgical outcomes. Now, when she looked at the groups that were most similar meaning those women who had breast conservative surgery or mastectomy with reconstruction. And this is not the type of procedure that you had, Terry. This Mm -hmm. is traditional reconstructive surgery. Mm -hmm. If you look at the purple, when she asked them, was your breast or your chest wall a part of your sexuality now or not? 40%, regardless of procedure, felt it was no longer a part. They lost their sensuality after surgical treatment in their breast. And in fact, if you look at the orange, one in five who had a mastectomy with reconstruction or a lumpectomy, one in five had an unpleasant sensation, 50% after reconstruction were anesthetic or didn't feel anything. And 30% were, didn't feel anything in the treated breast wonder what, where lumpectomy is performed because with lumpectomy, comes breast radiation as well. And so that had a negative impact. And if there's a way for people 
to preserve their sensuality and undergo treating treatment for breast cancer. It is something that we should be advocating. So this new concept of nerve sparing mastectomy and the preliminary data that's coming out and the testimonials that are coming out are so important to drive this as not a quote fringe option, but one that should be standardly available. Yeah, I think we do have to draw that conversation because, you know, there's a difference between <clears throat> nerve preservation at the time of mastectomy and nerve reconstruction, which is what mm-hmm. I had. Um, and, and so I think that it's important for women to ask about these procedures. Again, we have to drive the conversation to me for a couple of reasons, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Devon. I think to bring awareness so that women can ask if, if it is available. But to me, the more we talk about it, especially at conferences, the breast surgery conference, the plastic surgery conference, to get surgeons on board and talking the same language to let patients know how important this is for sexual mm-hmm. health. You know, and, you know, there is... Um evidence Mm -hmm. that driving those conversations starts with patient advocacy very recently. um, And it was actually uh, the result of work of um, Colette Baer, who was an undergraduate at Brown University. Mm -hmm. She conducted a survey that ultimately led to a new term that is, that has infiltrated the surgical literature because within this group of people undergoing treatment for breast cancer are a group of people who don't want to reconstruct after mastectomy as a choice. And they are called themselves part of the go flat movement. And they coined the term aesthetic flat closure, which now is a part of the surgical um, nomenclature. So this is the same thing we have to help our advocates and we have to help folks like you raise awareness that nerve sparing mastectomy should be routinely offered or at the very least better studied so we can see how often it works. Yes, because there are instances where it becomes very structurally and oncologically difficult to perform at the time of mastectomy. So all of that, yeah, all of that is, uh, boy, we could go off on about a hundred different topics. Um, This has been enlightening. What I would like to do is to take a deeper dive with you. So I'm dangling a carrot here for our listeners and let's take a deeper dive, have a longer conversation And let's schedule a podcast. That sounds lovely. All right. Listen, I want to thank you today. Do you have any final words for us today just to wrap up this uh, educational YouTube about sexual health? Yeah, I would say to everyone listening that if your sexual health is important, don't give up asking about it. You deserve it. And if you want it, you shouldn't have to give that up like you've had to give up so much else due to breast cancer. I love that. No matter what age or stage you are in. A hundred percent. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. If the viewers have any questions or comments, please let us know. And I want to thank Dr. Don Bison again today for joining us on the channel. Thank you so much.